I have a helper with me today who is, who is with me. This is my daughter, Adelia, and um, Adelia is uh, very excited about her name. Uh, we've named her after Adelia Patton Van Horn. Maybe you should step over here so they can see you a little better. She's going to sit with me up here, I think. But Adelia Patton Van Horn was the first woman uh, to hold an official position in our church. Uh, she was a virtually an adopted daughter of James and Ellen White, the only one to take a family photo with the Whites. And um, yeah, she was an amazing, amazing woman, and we'll probably have to write a biography after about Adelia Patton Van Horn. But that's, that's where we got the name of Adelia, and uh, it's kind of fun, huh? Do you want to say anything? Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, friends, it's good to be with you. Welcome to Canada. Did you know that you're in Canada right now? The name of this region of Battle Creek that you are currently in was known as Canada in the antebellum period. Why? Because a man named Erastus Hussey was operating a stop on the Underground Railroad right here in this area and helped over a thousand slaves to freedom. The Seventh-day Adventists bought that land from Erastus Hussey and they continued that legacy, not necessarily in helping slaves. We don't have any evidence that they did that directly, but they still had a culture of protecting African Americans in this region, and that name sticks. And so it was called Canada, because if you were African American, you could come here, and it was as if you were in Canada. You were that safe. Why and how did our pioneers have that reputation? Where does that come from? We're going to talk about that right now. So, our presentation I've titled Tactics of Civil Engagement, The Case of Adventist Abolitionists. And we're going to start with the beginning, and we're going to look at sort of uh, a variety of the, the ways that the Adventists, the early Adventists, engaged in the anti-slavery movement. Now, I have not able to, to, to share every single kind of tactic. There are things today that I will not be able to include. So I'm just talking about some of the main things. But we'll do the best we can with the time we've got, and please, Jennifer, I can talk forever, so when it gets to the time where I need to stop, give me some warning, I will just wrap it up wherever we are, and we'll just end it wherever we are. So that's where we're gonna go. But you gotta have a little bit of context for this, right? Because you need to know what was it like in America in the region where Adventists uh, began to do their thing? What was it like in that region? And Adventism arose in the North, and so what was it like there? We need to talk about the Jim Crow North and the evangelical majority, as well as slavery. So a lot of people uh, uh, know about slavery and they assume that it was all in the South and that's mostly true. There were some border states though that still had slavery and during the Millerite period, slavery was still legal in places like Connecticut and New Hampshire. You may not have known that. And there were actually still some slaves in Connecticut during the 1840s. I think the last slave was liberated in 1848 in Connecticut. Um, and so slavery was actually a thriving business that was driving the world economy. Not just the American economy, but global economy. And it was a booming, growing business. You can see this graphic that is showing the spread of slavery as you're getting close to 1860. And we see from between 1619, which is actually not the first year that slaves came to what would become the United States, but the first time that they came to the region of New England, there were slaves that come even earlier than that in Florida, in that area. Um, with the Spanish. But between 1619 and 1865, it's estimated there were about 10 million slaves during that whole period. And according to one historian who's done an estimate published in 2020 in the journal Slavery and Abolition, these slaves contributed at about 410 billion hours of free labor. Now, I want you to think about that number. It's actually impossible for my brain to wrap around that. What that means is if you added up all of the free labor of all the slaves during the, all of those years, there would be more than almost 47 million years of free labor. That's insane. So when we talk about how America is built upon the backs of slavery and about how all of the freedoms and maybe prosperity that we have is attributed to slave labor, we're not joking. We have a huge debt and yet this country has never given one dime. There are no reparations have ever been paid no justice or wrongs have been righted or even attempted to be righted. That's just the fact of our nation. So once slavery was abolished, both in the North and the South, the white majority had to come up with a way to deal with the issue of race. They wanted to make it clear that blacks were not equal to whites. And so once slavery was abolished in the North, 
they, des they designed something called Jim Crow. They called it Jim Crow. And what that meant was segregation, racial segregation. And it was in every single aspect of life in the antebellum north. And so here's a quote from Richard Archer who wrote a book called Jim Crow North that gives you some idea uh, about this. He says, quote, schools were often not available. Well-paying employment was non-existent. Transportation was segregated or refused. Church attendees were separated so that even visiting African-American ministers had to sit in a distant black pew or balcony. Travelers had to eat in kitchens rather than in dining rooms and sleep in garrets rather than in bedrooms. All that was abundant and clear was humiliation and disdain. Compounding these troubles, the colonization society was trying to send free blacks to Africa. So there's a lot to unpack there. And you may not know what colonization is, so let me give you a quick 101 on that. The colonization society, and these are people that sometimes are confused with abolitionists, they are people that are saying, we don't want black people to live in America. So if they had any sort of inkling that they didn't like slavery, they said, let's liberate those slaves, but then send them to Africa or somewhere else, but not the United States. And so really what's going on, though, is that was more of an ostensible way to, to try to slowly and gradually get rid of slavery. More often, they were just getting free blacks out of the country, which exposes the sheer racism of the colonization society. And the abolitionists were utterly and absolutely diametrically opposed to the approach of colonization. If there's anything that defined abolitionism is that they are anti-colonizationists. They are advocating for two things. Number one, the immediate and total abolition of slavery. And number two, equal rights for blacks in this country. And so that's what they were fighting for. And every aspect of society is working against them. Now, what we, we also see happening is in the South, once slavery is abolished through the Civil War, what happens in the South? We see Jim Crow rising again. They just follow the same pattern. It's the same pattern and it doesn't change. Now, what is America and Christianity and America doing at this time? In a nutshell, it is the right arm of slave power. The evangelical majority, which is basically just about everyone, either in actual church attendance or definitely in the sense of culture, most Christians, North and South, they do not view slavery as a clear moral evil. And you might say, why? There's beatings, there's chains, there's rape, there's all kinds of manners of separating families. Every kind of sin you can imagine is happening. How could they not see that as an actual sin? Well, they would say, look, most of the slaveholders are Christians. So how can it be evil? It's been practiced for thousands of years. How can this be wrong? And so if you push them hard enough, they might say, okay, well, maybe it's not the ideal, but... If it is an evil, God's going to wink at that in the judgment. And so no one's going to be damned for that. You're safe. And that's what the majority of Christians are doing in this country. And this is at a time when just about everybody is either practicing Christian or culturally aligned that way. And so what are they saying? They say, stay silent. The Christians at the time, all of them, all the leaders are saying, stay silent. Abolition is wrecking and dividing the church. You got to stay silent. Don't get involved with politics. Don't jeopardize the mission of the church. Focus on saving souls. Sound familiar? Not much has changed, friends. Not much has changed. The abolitionists responded, by the way, and they said things like silence is crime. Silence is, in, is a complicity in the guilt of slaveholding. They said, no, 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 slavery is dividing the church, not abolition. Slavery is dividing the church. We have to get rid of this evil if we want to save souls because it's blocking the salvation of souls. It is blocking the mission of the church. We cannot move forward until we get rid of this evil. That's how they responded. But they were thwarted every step of the way by the evangelical majority. And so the Adventists, like abolitionists more broadly, they did a lot of different things to break that silence. One thing that is overwhelmingly and abundantly clear, no matter how you look at it, there is no way that you could argue that the Adventist pioneers were silent on these issues in their day. They were anything but that. So let's talk about petitioning. This is just one way. This is a guy that uh, uh, this guy over here, Dr. Strayer, knows a little bit about. He wrote the biography of John Byington. And I remember sending these petitions to, to Dr. Strayer uh, a few years ago. Well, petitioning started with petitions to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia and in the territories. 
And the territories we're talking about here is Florida and Texas at this time. Okay? And the reason that they're agitating for that issue is because they do believe that states have their rights to protect slavery uh, in their own territory, in their own state. Um, but they did think that the federal government had the authority to abolish slavery in the nation's capital, the District of Columbia, as well as those territories that were under their control. And so they're pushing for this. And this is such an outrage in America that in 1836, at the tail end of Andrew Jackson's presidency, you have a gag rule that is passed in Congress that says we cannot talk about slavery in the House of Representatives anymore. It's verboten. And that gag rule will continue to be passed until it becomes a standing rule of order, and it will remain in effect until 1844. We're going to come back to that because we have a role in the Adventist church that plays a role in getting rid of that gag law. But it starts with these petitions, and then after this, and, and by the way, you see John Vine's signature there. You see that? Just above it, Harry G. Buck, that's another future Seventh-day Adventist minister. Okay? So these are people that are involved in that process. After this goes on, you do have people that are going to start to agitate getting rid of the gag law. If you're not aware, you have a constitutional right in this country to be able to petition. Okay? And so if you're going to say that you cannot send petitions on slavery to Congress, that's violating the constitutional right. And so the abolitionists rally behind that effort and push the issue forward. And so, for example, this is one petition that was sent in to the, st uh, to the state of Maine. And they got this, the legislature of the state of Maine to forward on this complaint as a state to, uh, to Congress. And it was only signed by women. Women, in fact, were the most uh, active petitioners in America at this time. And only women of uh, 18 years or older are able to sign this petition. And guess what? You see both of the women, it's hard to see for you probably, both of the women in James White's family that are old enough to sign are signing here. His mother, Betsy White, and his daughter, uh, sister, sorry, Elizabeth. And so they are playing a role here in that work. And James White remarks that he grew up in, a, in, a, in an anti-slavery household. Uh, and uh, you see his father uh, participating in a variety of ways as well as some other members of his family. There's other issues that get added onto this because as you're starting to push the issue of slavery and you can't talk about slavery itself, you start talking about things that are related to slavery and you can honestly talk about them without using the word slavery. So one issue that's related here is capital punishment. And so Bates, uh, Joseph Bates and other pioneers were pacifists. And so even after the Great Disappointment, Bates is signing petitions like this where he wants to abolish the death penalty in Massachusetts. One of the reasons for that is because, like today, black and brown bodies are disproportionately targeted in the criminal justice system. And those people end up with capital punishment at, at their door. And Bates is among other people, uh, abolitionists at the time, who were trying to get rid of that uh, for everybody, but also because of the fact that uh, non-whites are being disproportionately targeted. Another fascinating issue that they're petitioning for is for the U.S. to recognize the independence of Haiti. Now, why is this a thing? Well, Haiti won its independence in a bloody, violent slave revolt. In fact, it was the only, it is the only slave revolt to actually succeed in world history. That happens in the turn of the 19th century, and uh, the, the, the French who are there occupying that place, they are defeated, uh, and they are kicked out, and the Haitians win their independence and liberty. Um, but the United States refused to recognize uh, Haiti as an independent nation until 1862. Why? There's a couple main reasons. Number one, this is at a time in America's history where you don't want to do anything to sort of legitimize a slave revolt. Okay? And so if you recognize the independence of Haiti and that is the cause of the independence, that is going to make people in the South very upset and very nervous. Rightly so. But the abolitionists, even though most of them were pacifists, they said if white people can get their freedom through violence in the American Revolution, then why can black people not do the same? That was their justification, even though they were pacifists themselves. But a bigger reason was, in, was involved here. And this is that in the science of the day, in the interpretation of the Bible in the day, most every single white person in America believed that black people were not mentally, physically, emotionally capable of governing themselves. And so if you recognize Haiti as an independent nation, you are flying in the face of science, you're flying in the face of, of the understandings of scripture that everyone believes is true, and this just cannot happen. And so the abolitionists are pushing 
for this issue because they recognize the stakes that are involved here. And you see lots of Adventists involved in signing petitions and circulating petitions. Bates does these too. Bates does all of them. Um, but these are, these are a couple of the people that I wanted to highlight. Stockbridge and Louisa Howland. Now, if you don't know who they are, they're very close with James and Ellen White. They are the ones that are going to basically raise the White's children as the Whites are traveling around. Henry will end up dying in their home later. So many meetings and conferences were held in their home, and it was such an important Adventist way station that it was known as Fort Howland. This is a major, major kind of thing. And, and Stockbridge and Loiza were radical abolitionists like most of the rest of our pioneers. Another issue that's involved here is that uh, voting. Uh, voting was a privilege for white people, white men specifically. Women couldn't vote till 1920, okay? Um, but also African Americans were not allowed to vote in America except for the four upper New England states of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts. But because of the fact that voting is not private yet, voting is a public act until the 1870s, anybody and everybody knows if you vote and who you're voting for because you take a particular colored ballot to a particular polling station for that party and they know if you're voting. And so because of that, if people wanted to prevent you from voting, they could do that with physical force. And so there are, uh, there are people that are allowed to vote, African Americans who are allowed to vote, but most of them wouldn't do so because they were afraid of the blowback. And so virtually no African Americans had the ability to vote. In places like New York, technically you were allowed to vote if you could own $300 worth of property. But in the entire state of New York, in the 1830s and 40s, take a guess at how many African Americans owned $300 worth of property in the entire state. About 50. About 50. And so effectively, no one has the right to vote in, in New York, okay? Even though in some sense, it's kind of allowed, right? And so you have ab, uh, Adventists, abolitionists of all kinds, but Adventists included, who are going to petition and push for uh, black manhood suffrage. And so this is one Adventist minister, uh, Reverend Ezra A. Poole, and he's fun to talk about because he was part of a radical uh, bunch of rebels known as the Lane Rebels. In the 1830s at the Lane Theological Seminary, a group of people under the leadership of an abolitionist, big, big name abolitionist named Theodore Dwight Weld, they want to debate slavery at their seminary. And they are forbidden to do so. And as a result of that, because the, the, uh, the leaders there would not allow them to even talk about slavery, they end up revolting, rebelling, as you will, if you will. They're called the, the Lane Rebels, and they end up going down to Oberlin and helping start Oberlin College. And so Ezra A. Poole is with one other person who I can't remember the name of right now, and Theodore Dwight Weld, where after they rebel there, they make a raft. They sail it down a creek until they get to the river, and then they float all the way down to Oberlin. It's a very fascinating journey. And so Ezra A. Poole is there, then he becomes a Millerite minister. He's a Congregationalist before, he becomes a Millerite minister, and then he moves on into the Seventh-day Adventist church and becomes one of our Seventh-day Adventist ministers. And he is very involved in the anti-slavery movement his whole life, uh, and he's one of the many that are uh, agitating for uh, uh, blacks, black men to have the right to vote. These petitions get radical, uh, even for some people today perhaps, because one of the major issues that they were petitioning for in Massachusetts was to abolish the interracial marriage ban. There were laws on the, in, on the books that if you were white, you could not marry uh, a black person or Native American, and all, of course, all the vice verses that go with that, right? And so in 1839, uh, abolitionist women, as I said, they were the driving force of petitioning. They put forth the first major petition drive to legalize interracial marriage in Massachusetts. And a lot of Adventists are involved. You see Prudence Bates is involved here. Uh, Mary Nichols is involved in this petitioning here. That's the wife of Otis Nichols. He's the one who makes the first prophecy chart that the Adventist church has. But because of this, there's a huge blowback in the press. And what they literally do is they start to argue, why is it that all of these mostly white women are petitioning for interracial marriage? It must be because they're lusting after black men. And so they present them in the press and in drawings, this is just one of many, as doing what they call an amalgamation waltz, where you have all these white women dancing with these black men who have exaggerated features and a very racist kind of depiction here, to sort of give this, uh, this idea, and forgive me, mostly it's my daughter, that this is all about interracial sex. And this is a scare tactic that they're, they're trying to use to get rid of this 
or to prevent this law from going away. Well, the men start to rally in 1840 to support this cause and show that it's not just the women who want this, it's all of us. <laughs> and so at that point, Joseph Bates will start not just signing these petitions, but circulating them as well. And so he does this, William Gifford, another Seventh-day Adventist are gonna be doing this. And this is another issue that they are starting to push forward in Massachusetts specifically. Um, it's fascinating to, to think about all of these issues, and there's a, there's a few more that you're going to come to. Um, that's radical. I mean, we live in an era where there are people today who think that inter interracial marriage is, is a sin. I mean, it come, it's in my family heritage. I, I have uh, family members still living who insist that the Bible says you cannot be unequally yoked. And I say yes, and it says with an unbeliever. <laughs> but they insist upon passages like that as still being used as... as proof that we cannot have this simple thing. Anyhow, that is one way. Petitioning was one way that the Adventist pioneers fought against slavery. They continued to do so. I, I, I could have, and I probably should have shown you, one of our students at Southern, I led a group there to the National Archives right before COVID, and uh, I gave them all a, a batch of petitions to look through, and one of our students at Southern found a petition uh, that has our name, Seventh-day Adventist, in it, which is amazing. Because we got the name in 1860, and this is a petition signed by Seventh-day Adventists and others in Lynn County, Iowa, urging Lincoln and Congress to abolish slavery everywhere in the nation. It was a really cool petition to see. I, I'm sorry that I didn't put that in this presentation to show you, but that, that's, a, that's a neat thing to see. But there's also the tactic of voting. Now, voting was mostly a big deal in the 1840s because there was a party that arose in 1840 called the Liberty Party. Probably have never heard of it. The Liberty Party had only two things on its platform. It was a very unique party. Number one on their platform, the immediate and total abolition of slavery. Number two, equal rights for black people. That's it. This party claimed that the Bible was their textbook. This party combined religion and moral influence as a driving force of this party. It's very different than parties are today, but they did, they did it on a single issue. They weren't trying to do things like white nationalists are today. Okay, <laughs> they were doing it for the, the sake and cause of social justice. And as it turns out, the best that I have been able to determine so far, and there's a lot more research I could still do, but it seems as though between 10 and 25% of the Liberty Party were, it was composed of Adventists. And I think that's fairly conservative. I'm basing that off of one of the weaker states in the, in, the, in the Liberty Party's history. And there are some states like Massachusetts and New York where it was much stronger. And so the numbers could have been higher than that. What is overwhelmingly and abundantly clear is that Adventists had enough power within the Liberty Party where you couldn't mess with them, basically. There's a lot of people at this time who were going to criticize the Millerites as crazy fanatics and all of that kind of stuff. You read the Liberty Party papers, and they're supporting them. Or silent, one of the two. And there's, there's at least six Liberty Party papers, if I remember correctly, that are actually openly promoting William Miller and Adventism in the anti-slavery paper. And so there's a strong connection here. You have many of our Millerite churches that are actual Liberty churches, where the minister is one of the leaders of the Liberty Party in that area, and the whole church is the rallying, driving anchor of the Liberty Party in that city. You have people like David Plum in Utica, Elon Galusha in Perry and Lockwood. These are all in New York. George Storrs, his church in Albany. Garrett Smith in Peterborough. Francis Hawley in Casanova. And Charles Fitch in Cleveland. All of these people have Liberty churches and they're rallying the vote and they will sometimes have Liberty meetings in their, in their churches itself. Many major leaders of the Liberty Party were also Millerite. Garrett Smith, one of the most prominent abolitionists bar none. This man would have been a multi-billionaire by today's standards, and he was, he was bankrolling a huge portion of the anti slavery movement. He is right up there with people like William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. He is that prominent, and he was a, uh, he was a Millerite and continues on with Adventism in some form until his death, and in 1849, guess what? He accepts the Seventh-day Sabbath and keeps that with his wife until his death as well. And so he has a, pu a huge influence on Adventism that we still don't yet know the full impact of. You have Alvin Stewart, who was one of the founders with Garrett Smith of the Liberty Party. He is very likely, and I say only probably, a Millerite because I know he's in a Millerite congregation and the Millerite minister says the whole congregation or we all believe in the soon coming of Jesus. But I don't have anything directly from Alvin Stewart saying he is a Millerite, so that's why I say probably, but it's almost guaranteed. <laughs> And so he's one of the founders. He is the, 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 the foremost intellectual leader on this, uh, in this party. 
uh, who's going to argue that the Constitution itself is an anti-slavery document rather than a pro-slavery document. You have other major leaders uh, and publishers like Abel Brown Jr. and there's many others I could mention and I'm going to mention one more a little bit later. You have Millerite Liberty Lectures. They're, they're going around and they're preaching on the soon coming of Jesus and they're preaching to vote for the Liberty Party. Now why are they doing this? Let me, ask, let me give you some idea why they're doing this. One thing that's doing the whole, like one, one ideology over the whole gamut of abolition is this. If you believe Christ is coming soon, if you believe that heaven is going to be an integrated place, which most Christians, by the way, thought it would be segregated, but Adventists thought it would be integrated. If you believe that is true, then you better show that you believe that and live that right now to prepare for the coming of Christ. So this is a huge thing. And so one of the taglines for the Liberty Party is vote as you pray and pray as you vote. So to preach Millerism and the Liberty Party in the same venues fit like a hand in a glove. Okay? Now, there are many of them doing this. You can see some of the names there. You've got Millerite li uh, Liberty editors and uh, publishers. You also, which I think is very fascinating, and this is just a drop in the bucket. I've only given you a few names here. There were also Millerites running for office in 1843 and 1844 for the Liberty Party. Now, some people at the time said uh, uh, the Millerites are, are they're disingenuous. They're not holding up true to their faith because if they really believe that Christ was coming soon, why would they remain active abolitionists? And they responded and said, no, we are doing this because we believe Christ is coming soon. Yeah. And so we had people, including the, Henry Lyon, Jonathan T. Orton, these are people that have become Seventh-day Adventists. They're running for office for the Liberty Party in 1843 and 1844, even though they believe they may never serve in that office at all. It's phenomenal. So here's, here's a few more, just so that you can see. M prominent people. Joseph C. Small, he's a Millerite minister there in Maine, and he is running for, excuse me, county commissioner in 1842, 1843, 1844. He's an Adventist the whole time. None of that bothers him. He just keeps on going. This is what you do. You demonstrate your faith by your actions. Okay? There are other people. This is one of the most prominent that I've come across. In the state of Verm uh, New Hampshire, the very top of the ticket Here's the presidential candidate, James G. Burney, who also may have been a Millerite because he is a, he is a brother-in-law of Garrett Smith. Okay, and there's some clues that he may have also been a Millerite himself. I, I have not any solid evidence on that. Vice presidential candidate, Thomas Morris. And who are the electors? Two of these men are Millerite Adventist ministers, Peter Clark and Noah Piper. In 1844, look at the date, October 17. <laughs> Friends, there's no stopping here. There's no blip on the radar. There's no pausing. Let's, let's not involve ourselves in abolition. Let's just focus on the second coming. You did both together because they went together. Right? Here's another case here. This is also 1844. September 25, 1844. This is the State Liberty Convention for New Jersey. The secretary of that is a major Millerite minister, William F. Gardner. He's heavily involved here. This is the Liberty Albanac for 1844, edited by J.N.T. Tucker, an Adventist. This is like, there's a huge ocean, my friends, of connections between Adventism and anti-slavery, and I, I think I've only even scratched the surface. I got, I got to the point where I had to stop at about 700 pages. So let me give you some influence here that Adventists had in the Liberty Party. Let's talk about Charles Fitch and Edward Wade. Edward Wade was an Adventist. He was a Millerite in Charles Fitch's congregation in Cleveland, and he remains an Adventist for more than a decade. He, he probably leaves in the mid-1850s, it seems. He is the U.S. Congress candidate for Ohio's 20th Congressional District. Okay, that includes uh, Lake and Cuyahoga counties, and he's running for that office in 1843, 1844, and 1846. Edward Wade is perhaps the most prominent abolitionist in the state of Ohio. He is definitely one of them, if not the most prominent. And he is there in Charles Fitch's church in Adventist Millerites. They rally to support him in, this, in, this, in these elections. And they push forward the growth of the Liberty Party in Charles Fitch's region in Ohio. And so Liberty growth had stagnated before Charles Fitch moved there in 1842. You saw that they didn't grow much over, the, over that year at all. Charles Fitch gets there, starts preaching anti-slavery. He was, he was so eloquent. Everyone loved him, even if you hated him. <laughs> Um, and so he rallies that, that cause there and makes his congregation the center of the abolitionist movement in Cleveland. 
And so after he does that, Edward Wade gets brought in, his political power gets drawn into the service, and they are a formidable force. And so what you see here, in February 1844, by the way, one of the things that Charles Fitch will do, he will rally and they will co-found with Edward Wade and others the Liberty County, uh, the Lake County Liberty Association. Fitch is not stopping in any kind of way whatsoever. And they uh, they uh, they rally and boost the vote. Now, what does that mean? Painesville, where they organize that Liberty Association, it is the third highest percentage of the total vote in Ohio. That's impressive until you realize how many people voted, and that was only 5.6% of the people. <laughs> now, you need to understand that abolitionism was never popular. If you think about the entire North, only about 1 or 2% of Northerners were ever part of the abolitionist movement. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny one. Okay? Some regions like this get a little higher than that, but the whole average is 1 or 2%. And, and between 1842 and 1844, the Liberty Party in Cuyahoga County, where Cleveland is, is the center there, the county seat, it increases its vote by 96.8%. Now, I'm sure there's other factors, but the biggest factors in the room are Charles Fitch and Edward Wade. And they, this places their growth in that county almost 25% higher than anywhere else in the entire state. Millerism had a huge impact on anti-slavery, and it was a blessing and a boon for the cause. It made it grow, not, uh, not get smaller. Let's talk about boycotts and civil disobedience. These are some other ways that Adams got involved. And uh, here we have, uh, um, uh, this is the son, it's pictured here of that of Adams couple, Elias and Henrietta Platt. Now, Elias and Henrietta Platt were Seventh-day Adventists, and they lived in the town of Bath, New York. Okay, James and Ellen White will actually go and stay in their home. They will stay in their home in the early 1850s uh, when they joined the Adventist church. Platt, Elias Platt, runs a store, but it's not just any store in Bath. He runs a store where they boycott slave labor products. They refuse to sell things like molasses or sugar that were grown with slave labor. And so he worked extra hard to find free sugar and sell free sugar so that people who wanted to not support the, the, the capitalist marketplace that is boosting slavery, they could have an alternative. There were some Adventists who do that. It was a, this is one of the rarest forms of anti-slavery advocacy because it's the hardest. We still have this issue today, by the way. If you're not aware, most chocolate that is harvested around the world, most cocoa, is, is harvested by child slaves in West Africa. You may not know that, but if you enjoy things like Hershey or any of the name brands that you know, you need to understand that that's picked by child slaves between the ages of five and 16. Okay? That's now. That's right now. We need abolitions today, my friends. You may not be aware of this, but you have to work hard if you want to find chocolate that's not uh, produced by slave labor. The hardest is actually finding in things like ice cream. Ben and Jerry's is the only one that I've been able to find that, that doesn't use slave labor products in ice cream. <laughs> then there are other kind of boycotts and protests that Adventists are involved in, and one of them is battling the Jim Crow cars. Joseph Banks is involved in this. He's circulating petitions to get rid of the Jim Crow segregation and all that. Uh, but there's other ways that they were involved as well. By the way, this is what a train looked like in the 1830s and 40s. Quite Spartan. Guess which car was known as the Jim Crow car or the Negro car or the Inward car? It was this one. And if you can see it close enough, you say, well, that's got all the baggage. Yeah, it's got all the baggage. That's where you put people that you don't want to sit next to. It's the dirtiest, ricketiest car, uncomfortable. And that's where you were forced to ride if you were if you were not white. They would also get the soot from the engine. They would also get the soot from the engine, the yeah. dust, the, the, their lungs are filled with that nastiness. It was horrible. And so you see, you see black Adventists suffering through that condition. One is Richard Johnson. He is trying to take uh, his daughter and a group of other black Adventists to the Millerite camp meeting that Joseph Bates had organized in Taunton. And they go there because they had been promised that the Jim Crow cars would be eliminated. We don't have all of the details, but what is interesting, if you look at the timing, is that Joseph Bates and other abolitionists are working on organizing this camp meeting, and just a few days before the camp meeting starts, the Liberator, William Lord Garrison, announces that it is safe to ride on the trains. They have promised they will not segregate. And so blacks go there, try to get on that train. 
and they refuse. And Richard Johnson decides that he's not going to sit in that Jim Crow car, and so he pays extra money, him and the rest of the blacks with him, to take a private coach to get to the Millerite camp meeting, and they went anyways. Well, other Adamists faced an even more difficult situation. This man here, Jabez Campbell, who goes on to become a, a major African-American leader in the United States, he was a Millerite. He gets beaten within an inch of his life and almost dies because he had the audacity to sit in a white car. Mm. They step in on his throat, they're beating him. I mean, he, he almost died because of that. And he says, out of the great, greatness and graciousness of his heart, well, this is happening just like a, a month or so, a month and a half before they thought the world was going to end. And he said, well, God's going to take care of it. Mm. And so think about people like that for a minute. We've talked about the greatness of God in so many times, in so many ways, but it's always been through a white Adventist lens. Have you ever thought what it was like for a black Adventist, especially black Adventist slaves, and there were thousands of those, for what that great disappointment would have been like? Jabez Campbell never got justice on this earth. And so many others had the same fate. It was just back to the status quo. There's another case here where Hugh B. Luge and Adams there is he's with a uh, uh, a uh, prominent Bostonian named Daniel Mann, not an Adventist that we know of, and they get word that there's a black person who has gone on the white car, and they're abolitionists, and they rush to get on that car as quickly as they can, and they sit right next to him, and there's several abolitionists that surround this man to protect him. And then a few minutes later, a gang of white people that work for the train company, they come there and say, there's the man I want out, get him out, get rid of this D-A-N-N inward. And the abolitionists all around say, don't let him go, we want him to be here. And then everyone on the whole car on the train says, we don't mind him being here, let him stay. And they refuse. Mm -hmm. And so they violently extract this person, and then they come back and they say, I want every one of these DAMN abolitionists out of here. And they physically and violently remove uh, Hugh Luge and Daniel Mann and others and get them off of that train. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the ways that white abolitionists tried to boycott the system. Any time that that happened, any time that they saw a black person there, they tried to sit around them to protect them. Sometimes white abolitionists also got onto the Negro car to ride on that car to prove that they were supporting them, <laughs> they, they, how, how futile this was. But they were not allowed to ride in the Negro car. They were violently removed from those cars. And so boycotting the train system and the, and the, and the uh, transportation system, that's something that happens did at the time. Much like what you see with boycotting and, and, and lunch counters and things like that during the civil rights era. Adventists didn't really do that. Had that mind, as you heard probably from Dr. Campbell yesterday. There's also civil disobedience. And uh, this is one of the most radical and difficult for me personally because we have a prophet from the Lord telling Adventists to break federal law. I, if, you, if you actually sit down and think about that in a sober way, would you have the guts to break a federal law? So, the Fugitive Slave Law is passed in 1850. Now, there had been one since 1793, but the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 gave it teeth. And so, this meant that if you were caught harboring a fugitive slave, mm -hmm. then you were going to face six months in jail and a $3,000 fine. Mm. This is a time, friends, when the average working person made $1,000 a year. You're talking about losing three years' salary, three years' wages, and another half of a year of lost time of work. This would cripple your family probably for the rest of their lives. I don't know how you could recover from that. And if you, if you uh, weren't actually harboring a slave, you also were forced by the law to help the slave catchers catch the slave. And if you resisted that, there were also penalties. And Ellen White, says this in, from a vision. Now, Adventists have been saying this years and years before this. They've been saying it from the moment of 1850 uh, and that law's passed. But Ellen White sees in vision, and she says this in the later 1850s, because by this point, the Republican Party, the Radical Party, is starting to rally to support the Fugitive Slave Law, to try to help keep the nation together. And at that time, Ellen speaks from God's authority. And she says this, which is starting to ruffle the feathers, I think, of even some Adventists, like an Alexander Ross. Okay? She says, where the laws of men conflict with God's word and law, we are to obey the word and law of God, whatever the consequences may be. The laws of our land, we're talking federal 
laws. The laws of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey, and we must abide by the consequences of the violation of this law. Friends, you have heard of Ellen White talking about a National Sunday Law. You have read in the great controversy that she says that there are going to be laws at the end of time that happens are duty about to break. But have you noticed that she says laws in the plural? She never meant us to focus solely on a, on a National Sunday Law. The very first time in her prophetic career that she talks about breaking laws is this. It's a racist law. We've been blinded to that. Who, have been, who, who of us have been watching for those laws? They've been on the books and they've been around ever since slavery was legal. There are all kinds of ways where these problems are persisting with us to this day. Who of us is watching that now? It should be the responsibility of us in quarrel. And I know some good people are doing that. This is how, this is how and why Adams responded this way. Have you ever noticed in Deuteronomy 23, 15, and 16 what it says here? <clears throat> this is what Abbas called God's future slave law. Mm -hmm. Take a look here. It says, Thou shalt not deliver to his master the servant, or some translations say slave, which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall, he shall dwell with thee, even among you, in that place which he shall choose, in one of thy gates, where it like it can best, thou shalt not oppress him. Friends, this is God's law here in the Pentateuch. And if that law had been followed, it cuts out the feet and legs of slavery because it makes slavery optional. If anyone was a slave and they wanted their freedom, they simply had to run away. Now that sounds easier maybe than it actually was. But it gives you sort of an out. And they're saying this is God's fugitive slave law. You cannot break and violate the law of God no matter what the laws of the land say. This is how they can stand on a firm foundation in Scripture. And you see people doing that. <clears throat> Dr. Strayer is here, and he can tell you more than I could about John Byington. But Dr. Strayer is the one who wrote the biography of Byington and gave credibility to the rumors that had circulated before that time that Byington had operated a stop on the Underground Railroad. I found a little bit more uh, of things buried, but, but Dr. Strayer, by, by a lion's share, found, found all that we currently know. And there are even, these are pictures from his biography of his book uh, of secret hiding places that John Byington built into some parish homes and was it some churches too? Uh, yes. Yes. And so this is actually still standing today. You can visit that yourself. And, and Byington is just one of many other Adventists, including seven of the Adventists that participated on the Underground Railroad. I could, I could list several more if we had time, but we're trying to move forward here. There's another case here which is fascinating and telling that I'd like to share. And this is, the, the man you see pictured here is Anthony Burns. Anthony Burns was a Millerite in the 1840s, but he was a slave in Virginia. Anthony Burns says in his autobiography that when Millerism came to his county in Virginia, the barriers of caste were thrown down, and there was a greater fraternity between whites and blacks that they had ever experienced. Mm. Now, if a white person had said that, you wouldn't believe it. But when it comes to Anthony Burns himself, it has credibility. And so it, it, it demonstrates that even though Millerism didn't liberate thousands and thousands of slaves, and there were some abolitionists, not abolitionists, abolitionists who thought Millerism would, would liberate slaves by the thousands, that never happened. A few did. A few, were, a few slaves were actually liberated under the Great Tent. Um, but Anthony Burns was still enslaved. And so. He ends up running away in the 1850s and he gets his freedom and he's living out in Boston. But in 1854, the slave catchers catch him. And the abolitionists do everything they can to try to liberate this man. They try to do it by physical force. They try to buy his freedom. But absolutely nothing would work because the President of the United States wanted to make this case, a demonstrable case, to prove to the South that the North is going to uh, abide by the change of slave laws. So they sent this man back. To the south. And what happens is, uh, is that people are outraged, abolitionists are outraged in particular, and James White will publish this from an abolitionist leader in Rochester, New York, where the headquarters of the church are at this time. And this is what Edwin R. Seaman, who was an abolitionist, says of this occasion. He says, a man made in God's image is torn from friends and society and all that is dear in life and dragged back into slavery by the power of that atrocious bargain of fugitive slave law. All men are created free and equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this is going to be his emphasis, not mine. 
He says, if this nation, America, would not be the most hypocritical nation on the face of the earth, it should amend this declaration thus, all white men, he puts the emphasis on white himself, all white men are created free, equal, etc. Has not this two-horned, lamb-like beast corrupted the commandment as well as the Roman dragon? Mm. Wow. Pause, friends, and think about that. You have been told and heard your entire lives about how the, the Catholic Church has changed times and laws. Have you ever heard that about the American nation? Have you ever heard that? That's what he's saying here. Has not America corrupted the commandment of God just like the Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. Why have we focused just on Sunday? The pioneers didn't. In fact, at this time, they were mostly focused on those racist black laws. Slavery, yes, but also all of the other black laws that kept free blacks from participating as equal citizens. And they said that's a violation of the law of God. Just like what the Catholic Church has done. Oh, how we have forgotten key things, I would say, in our past. Do I still have some time? Okay. I want to talk about how they tie in anti slavery protests with religious sort of services and events because this is really kind of fun for me. We've seen a lot of work that individuals have done, but when Millerites got together, they still fought against slavery too. I mentioned in passing that there were slaves liberated under the Great Tent. That did happen. There were four slaves that we know of that, that got the liberty. Uh, while uh, a, a, a Millerite minister preaches and he tells all of them, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to liberate your slaves right now, and someone actually did so. Wow. Someone actually did so. They actually all, by the way, claimed that they would do so, but only one actually did. But there were other ways that Adventists participate in this. And to start us off, I want to play you a little song. I hope you can hear it. Sound familiar? Bit of saving time, we'll pause it there. You recognize the tune? Oh, yeah. That was a song by the Hutchinson family singers, which was one of the most popular musical groups in the North and the antebellum period, and even afterwards. And that is a song uh, that is called The Old Granite State, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that and how, how it is that you recognize that song. Well, that tune. Uh, is taken from the hymn, the old churchyard, commonly known as You will see the Lord come, and you will see the Lord come, and you will see the Lord come in a few more days. Yep, it's taken from that hymn. And there's also poetic devices and some words and phrases borrowed from another hymn, another Millerite hymn called the Christian Band. And the song begins, uh, here is a band of brethren. The old granite state uh, uh, begins with... Uh, Sorry, the, the Christian band begins with, here is a band of brethren, the Millerite hand does. And the old grand state begins with, we are a band of brothers. So they're, they're clearly ripping off of not just the music, but also the words. Well, Joshua B. Himes was the first one to publish this song, The Old Church Yard, as you know, the you will see the Lord coming, in the summer of 1842, as they're on, on the campaign circuit for the very first time. And it becomes an instant, huge success among abolitionists. And there were at least half a dozen different versions of this song with different lyrics that are explicitly anti-slavery because the abolitionists loved it so much. 
How did they learn about it? Because they are also participating in these campaigns, because they are also Adventists. These abolitionists and Adventists are one of the same kind of people. And so the song is an incident among abolitionists. Um, one occasion, which I would love to tell you more about, because this is so fun with Adventist history, there is a Millerite come out named Thomas P. Beach, one of the most prominent uh, abolitionists in the state of New Hampshire. And he is very radical because he uh, helps to start a new tactic called speak-ins. Now, what is a speak-in? A speak-in is where you go into a, a, a church where they say that everyone has the right to talk and talk about anything you want. And so they go in there and they start talking anti-slavery. And they get shut down and violently dragged out of those congregations and thrown in jail. And so Thomas Beach is one of these people. And so he gets thrown in jail, and they don't even sit him for a specific period of time. They put him in there indefinitely. Now, that indefinite period ended about three months later. But while he's in jail, he starts publishing a paper called A Voice from the Jail. What is he doing in there? He's writing on anti-slavery, and he's reading William Miller's books. He was a Millerite before this time, but he's, he's reading Miller and inspired by this and all this kind of stuff. He talks about it. And he's publishing this paper, A Voice from the Jail. And it's rallying the cause of abolitionists to a huge way, but it's also so controversial. Some abolitionists say people have the right to refuse to hear. So you shouldn't go in there and try to force this conversation. So some of them say you shouldn't do that. But he's there doing this, and another Millerite is going to be involved with others in rallying support for the cause of Thomas Beach. And Adventists generally, they rally to this man's support. And so they get together in a convention to like, protest in Danvers, Massachusetts in November 1842. And the conventioners, as it says, quote, they sang an original song on the imprisonment of Brother Beach, which awakened considerable feeling and enthusiasm. This song was called and called for and sung several times during, uh, during uh, the remainder of uh, the convention, always with increasing effect. The convention then closed by singing once more what they call the Come Outers song. Uh, we don't have the lyrics for this version, and I wish we did. But it was written for the occasion in the tune admired so much by the Second Advent Friends, the Old Church Yard. Fascinating. Here's another version, published in The Liberator. It's called a hymn. William Lloyd Garrison publishes this in 1841, but you can see here at the top that this is sung to the tune, The Old Church Yard, right? This is another version of this song. Here's another one that's printed in, an, uh, in George Clark's Liber Liberty Minstrel that's rallying the support and the vote for James Burney. And it's sung to the tune uh, of the old churchyard. Here's another version, another, another, um, another uh, anti-slavery hymnal. This one's published in Hope Dale and connected with the Utopian Society there. And they've got another version here where they've got it set to the old churchyard tune. This was an immensely popular song. And I'm going to still help you understand why in a bit. The most popular version was the Old Granite State, which the Hutchinsons wrote and sang everywhere they went. Now, they also included, you didn't hear enough of the song, but they had explicit anti-slavery lyrics in that hymn, or that song they sang. And it is the very first song of many others that they wrote to oppose slavery. The Hutchinsons typically finished all of their concerts with this song, and as one historian has said, they were often rushed. The stage was often rushed because people were so excited about them and this music. And so the song remained immensely popular. And if you didn't know this, it was in 1931 that the nation chose a national anthem. But did you know that one of the contenders for that national anthem was, da da da, the old Granite State? Can you imagine what, what, it, what it would have been like to have a Millerite II being the national anthem of this country? I would have laughed. <laughs> Because there's been so much antagonism to Adventists through the years, that would have just been irony to its fullest. Anyhow, the Hutchins, Hutchinsons should be no surprise. They were Millerites. Okay? They used Millerite tunes and poetic devices in their songs, not just this one that we've talked about, but several others as well. In 1844, the Hutchinsons go to Miller's lectures in Philadelphia, and John Hutchinson later recalled, quote, I never witnessed such a gathering in my life. He proved quite plainly, according to the record of my diary made at the time, that the end of the world was near at hand. Mm -hmm. Now, the Old Church Yard was an abolitionist hymn in its own right. You will see the Lord coming as an abolitionist hymn in its own right, even though the word slavery is never mentioned in that tune. And here, here's how we know it. We know because how they used it. The Millerites used it as an anti-slavery hymn of truth. 
The song itself, we didn't know this before, but the song was written by a fugitive slave. We don't know his name, but we do know now that it was written by a fugitive slave. And the Millerites used it for anti-slavery purposes. So one of these camp meetings in Salem uh, that, that Joseph Bates is involved with organizing again with others, uh, this is, uh, by the way, the day before, Emancipation Day, August 1st, and they are going to use the Millerite camp meeting to bring it to a crescendo to advocate for the end of slavery. So the camp meeting itself and, and many others, they crescendoed with anti-slavery preaching. And so what happens is someone rings the bell to come to worship for the Millerite camp meeting, and there's 20,000 people here. And the great tent, it's, uh, people are coming to the great tent, filling it as much as they can, and people are standing all around. And all of a sudden, it, it says in the papers, quote, a numerous company entered the enclosure in regular order, led on by some half dozen black gentlemen, singing at the top of their voices, you will see the Lord coming, you will see the Lord coming, you will see the Lord coming in a few more days. What came after that? The Millerites came up and they started talking about Daniel and Revelation and going through all the calculations, right? That's what they did. Absolutely not. They had two fugitive slaves come up there and preach anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. This is how the camp meetings ended, friends. Mm -hmm. They climaxed with this way. Miller and Charles Fitch and Hyde would come in there and they would drum up everything, show from the Bible how the dates and all that worked, and they would end with anti-slavery preaching to demonstrate why this matters. Mm -hmm. Wow. So this is an anti-slavery hymn used in an anti-slavery way, even though the word slavery is never mentioned. There's another fascinating way that I've come across that Adventists sometimes use ritual, religious rituals, to fight against slavery. This is one of my favorites. This is taking place in Philadelphia, where Josiah Lynch is in charge of, of, of operations there. And what they want to do in, the, in November of 1843 is they want to have a Thanksgiving feast that will parallel, in a foreshadowing kind of way, what the great banquet in heaven is going to look like. And they said, if we want this to have meaning, we've got to show people that there's no slavery or segregation in heaven. And so they made a plan and said, let's go to the highways and the byways and gather everyone we can, white and black and whatever, whoever else we find, and let's bring them together and put a white person next to a black person to a white person next to a black person, ultimately around the entire table. That was their plan. But quickly, People in Philadelphia found out what was going on. And there was a huge wave of backlash against what they called the Grand Amalgamation Festival. And every single place in the city <coughs> closed their doors and said, you can't meet here. That is not allowed. And so it took several weeks. The Millerites did not give up. And they said, OK, we can't do this interracial gathering that we want to demonstrate what the kingdom of heaven will be like. So we will, I got you, we will just feed as many black people as we can. And so they did that in December. Several hundred people that they fed as a, as a protest against the racism in America and as a demonstration of what was coming very soon. Another racial, uh, uh, another radical uh, ritual that, uh, that happened was uh, a, a petition that Charles Fitch signed um, in his church during a Millerite revival. I'll we'll have to probably end with this one because it's time. Okay? But this is a fascinating and one of the most, one of the greatest examples of success that we had during the Millerite period. So Charles Fitch starts holding in early 1842, actually it's, it's late 1841, sorry, uh, a Millerite revival in Haverhill, Massachusetts, where he was just before he went to Cleveland. Like he did in Cleveland, that church in Haverhill was the headquarters and the the major bastion force of anti-slavery in that city. And some of his parishioners, they begin that, they begin the, 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 the revival, by the way, with uh, anti-slavery resolutions that they pass, how they were, how they're going to oppose slavery and how God is coming soon and you need to oppose slavery, all these kinds of things. That, that happens. But then as he's preaching, his, his parishioners are getting so riled up about this. And they said, let's do something really serious here. And they had seen People from South Carolina, for example, say, let's leave the Union because they're not going to protect slavery. Let's leave the Union and be our own thing. And there were threats of secession in the 1840s and even before that. And so some of Charles Fitch's parishioners say, let's turn that on its head. 
What if we wrote a petition arguing that the North should secede from the South because of slavery? What would that be? And so they gathered together in someone's past store, and this man here, Benjamin Emerson II, he drafts up a petition that is unanimously adopted, and Charles Fish loves it so much, they bring it into church the next day, which was a Sunday, probably the day after Christmas, where they're going to hold communion. Charles Fitch preaches on the second coming of Christ. Then they have communion, and they have all the things that are laid out on the altar, which at this time was a very sacred kind of object in those churches, especially congregations, or kind of ex-congregational kind of church. And they hold communion there. Then Charles Fitch has them clear off the altar. He says, bring forward this petition. And he lays it on the altar, and he invites his congregation to come sign it on that altar. You can't miss the significance, friends. Even to this day, the word petition is a synonym for prayer. And they viewed it in a religious way. They prayed to God and to the nation to have, a, have this vile evil eradicated. And so what happens with that petition is they, they try to get a few more signers afterwards, but it's, it's so radical that the people in the town are trying to mob them and rip up and destroy this petition. And so they have to hide it in a store, and they say, if anybody else wants to sign it, you need to make an appointment and come to the cover of darkness to do that. And it only is able to survive for another day, maybe two in those conditions. And they say, this is too hot, we have to get rid of it. And they mail it to John Quincy Adams, the ex-president of the United States, who was working as a representative for Massachusetts in Congress. And they recognize that Adams is an ally, and they say he might actually present the same. No one's ever done this before, but maybe he'll do it. And guess what? Adams had the gall and the guts to do it. <clears throat> Adams had the gall and the guts to do it. And my friends, that petition signed in the Millerite Revival by mostly Millerites, that changed this nation. Let me tell you how and why. Number one, Adams gets put on trial for treason. The ex-president, the most distinguished member of Congress, put on trial for treason. One member here, Congressman Gilmer of Virginia, calls for Adams to be hanged simply because he presents his petition Adams had a huge spike in death threats, more than he'd ever had in his life, because he presented this Millerite petition. And so for almost two weeks, this trial elapses, and Adams <coughs> uses it to his advantage and says, if there's going to be a trial, quote-unquote trial, I have the right to defend myself. Mm. And so Adams held the floor day after day and berated the evils of slavery, and the nation had to listen, despite the fact, remember, there's a gag law saying you can't do this. But the brilliancy of the Millerite petition was this. Emerson knew he couldn't put the word slavery in there, and so he didn't. He made it very clear that it was about slavery, but he left the word out. So Adam stands up and says, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if this comes under the gag laws or not. I need to read it. And he says, okay, go ahead. And so he reads the whole thing. <laughs> Adams was a brilliant man, my friends. And so were the Adamists that wrote that petition. And so they got away with it. And it was like instant silence, and then immediately everyone is swearing, cursing, it's loud, and they're yelling, and they're upset. And Adams, Adams is so brilliant, he just sits back there in his chair, and he's smiling. <laughs> Adams knows he's the most prominent member of the House. Adams is an ex-president. Adams knows he's safe. And at the same time, his friends are right to know that he, to know that he was not necessarily so. But he sits through that. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. And there's several other things that happen. So the first thing is Adams is put on trial. The second most impressive thing that happens is because of Adams' eloquent defense, every historian out there recognizes that this petition presented marks the beginning of the end of the gag laws. And so they barely scrape by a couple more times, and then they are voted out in 1844. And the Adams played a role in making that happen because they were the ones that did this petition in Charles Finch's church in the middle of the Miller Revival that caused this thunderstorm that rocked the nation. Wow. My friends, historians have noted that that was the greatest victory over slavery up to that date. Mm. We played a role in that. Mm. It wasn't just that, though. There was many other things that happened. Because of Adam's advocacy there over this issue, he starts to speak against the injustice of black sailors from the Navy south and thrown in jail when they get there. And so he starts to rally more people, more abolitionists rally to the cause, and especially for black southern rights because of these issues. And so this happens. 
And the last major thing that happens is that William Lloyd Garrison recognizes how, how effective this tactic was, and they made it the official motto of the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1844. Mm -hmm. And until the downfall of slavery in 1865, this unionism, no union with slaveholders, that becomes the official motto of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Mm -hmm. Adventism changed permanently the nation as well as the anti-slavery movement as a whole. Mm -hmm. There are many other ways. I recognize we're out of time. <laughs> but let's take some questions. Yeah, let's do that. If there are. Yes, Mike. You, you mentioned the, the sugar and the different ways. Um, maple syrup, I think it's a, could you comment a little bit more on the different ways that they uh, chose other alternatives or foods or different kinds of things sure. that the protest? Yeah, sure. They would they would um, they would try to gather sugar from somewhere grown in the north or maybe Canada or some other free uh, nation which is not doing it with slavery. It's very hard. Um, one of the things that's fascinating to me is that later, several years later, Joseph Clark, a Seventh Day Adventist, um, he recognizes the evils of this as well, and so he imports sugar cane uh, from Asia and starts to figure out how you can try to plant that in the state of Ohio. And then he writes, and he actually has some success, and he writes instructions to farmers in the state of Ohio about how you can grow free sugar in your own state. And so that's what, that's how he did it. Uh, there was also the issue of cotton, and they're, they're also trying to find places that, that pick and grow cotton. Uh, but it, like today, if you want to do anti-slavery chocolate, it's a lot more expensive. Right. It's a lot more expensive. And so it, it was very hard to do. And even if you were an abolitionist, very few people had a, were able to have a store that could sell those products. And so most abolitionists aren't able to do this. They just can't. They would have if they could, and they wanted to. But it was a very big challenge. Yeah, good. Any other questions? Yeah. So thank you very much. I think so many, like, just looking around at the attention of everyone, it's so inspired and encouraged. And obviously, this reflects years of research. And thank you so much for that. That said, right. I think. Um, it needs to be widely shared, right? Mm -hmm. And I think many of us working with Power Work would appreciate having access to your presentation, your information, um, to be able to yeah. help encourage our, 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 current, <coughs> our current members in civic engagement today, right? And so, again, as I said, I know this reflects years of, of hard work and history. Is there a way that you might um, be able to share some of the information with us to be able to? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm working now on publishing a book. Um, okay. my, my dissertation committee was very impressed with my dissertation, and um, it, it did pass with distinction, and their, my advisor is, is actually helping me get it published with the top press. Okay. That's the goal. Now, what will happen, we will see, but uh, we have a couple presses lined up that seem interested already. Um, I have to get them a manuscript by by next month, so it's a little pressure. And the main problem I have is that I wrote over 255,000 words, almost 700 pages, and so that's too long, um, and so I've got to try to reduce that in size. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot that's published yet. I've been presenting since the summer of 2020 on these issues, talked a fair amount about it, but uh, but that I want to see that work published at a good press because I want non adults to take it seriously for us. Would you do us a favor and keep Jennifer posted as far as when it's published, and then she can share Absolutely. with us more broadly? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I mean, this is the whole reason. But I think if we can get it published with a good press on a solid foundation, yeah. it will stand uh, the test of time. So that's that's the goal. Yeah. Thank you for your information. My question is, what do we do with it? <laughs> <laughs> What's your information? <laughs> I think, I think, I, I, I believe, I wasn't able to be here last time, but I believe that Dr. Campbell talked about how things changed, right, in the church. And one of the most tragic to me is if you compare Adventism in the 1860s, or even well, the, the antebellum period up through the 1860s, what happened in the build up to the civil rights of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, etc. It's night and day, friends. It's night and day. By that moment, uh, Adventist leaders had taken the evangelical majority position of stay silent. And there's irony here. And there's just flat out racism here. Because at the exact same time, Adventists are telling people to not get involved with the civil rights <clears throat> because it's political. At the exact same time, 
White Adventists are marching through the streets with banners that say ban the butt, end cigarette smoking, all this kind of stuff. Same tactics. They're lobbying in courts to protect people for, for religious liberty causes. They're involved with temperance advocacy and all kinds of political things. <coughs> Friends, the danger of, of, of politics is partisan loyalty, where it blinds you to your relationship and, and following of Christ. We should always be engaged in the issues and not be led astray by partisan politics. Yeah, yeah. But we should always be political in a broad sense of the term, in a Christian biblical way, of course, but I'm talking about issues, not partisanship. And so what I would like to see us do is reverse that reversal, change that stance. Let's stop being silent. There are problems today that we need to wake up to see and realize that they're affecting people today. One of the biggest issues today is mass incarceration. And historians have demonstrated that it is very much a form of slavery. You think slavery is abolished in this country? Did you know it's legal? Actually legal? The very 13th Amendment that abolished chattel slavery, go back and read it, it protects slavery in prisons. It protects slavery in prisons. All you need to do to keep race-based slavery alive is simply practice it. Have your law enforcement go around and target disproportionately black and brown bodies, throw them in jails, it's legal. You can then deny them all the rights that they have been denied their whole life, like the right to, uh, uh, the right to privacy, uh, the right to vote, um, the right to have fair and good housing, the right to a job. All of these things are legally denied to criminals. And it seems safe because we have, we have been prejudiced and thought and trained to think in a prejudiced way about criminals. We dehumanize them with the very word. But it is beyond dispute that in practice, our criminal justice system has swollen to the millions of, 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 of convicts, and they're disproportionately targeting black and brown bodies. Did you know that in this country, there are some black men who have never in their entire family's history had the right to vote, ever, because they are denied because they're in prison, their, their ancestors were denied during Jim Crow, and then those ancestors were denied because they were enslaved. Slavery still exists in this country, friends. We need to wake up to that. We need to do something about it. We need to not be silent. That is the base of what I've learned here. Mm -hmm. At base, the Adventist pioneer said, no matter what you do, do not be silent. Mm -hmm. And they weren't. Mm -hmm. We may question their tactics and the viability of what they did. We may say they didn't do enough. You can always make those kinds of arguments. But no matter what you say, you cannot deny the fact that they were not silent. And silence is complicity. Silence, as I have said, and if you read your Bible, silence is sin. Scripture says so. Silence in the face of injustice is an actual sin. And we are friends, I hate to say it, but we are guilty at a corporate level of that sin. That doesn't have to stay that way. We can change. We can go back to the roots on this issue. It'd be nice if we could, but it's going to take a lot of intentional effort. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think one of the uh, one of the issues that we need to we need to address, and 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 evangelical black pastors have addressed this issue, that a lot of the the laws in in this country have have just blown black families apart. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And 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 when you have families blowing apart, uh, you know that doesn't help the issues of, of crime or alleged crime at all. Absolutely not. Friends, if you want a great book to help you understand, uh, read Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law. It's been out for a few years. It helps you understand the the impact that we face today from racist laws that were legal ones in this country. Things like redlining, if you haven't heard about redlining, mm -hmm. that's a huge issue. Familiarize yourself with things like that. Um, yeah, one, one thing I probably should say, and, and I'm gonna apologize already for saying it, but I'm gonna say it anyways. Something that we need to remember and recognize in this country is how oppressive <coughs> democracy can be. Yep. Mm -hmm. My friends, there is no perfect form of human government out there. I hate, I hate to break it to you. 
democracy is just, it can be just as oppressive as oppressive as any other form of government. But the thing that's about democracy that makes it probably even more dangerous, perhaps, I'll be cautious there, is the fact that it masks it so well. The fundamental principle of democracy is this, majority rule. That's the fundamental principle of it. So if you're a minority in this country, and you don't have the rights that you should, how do you get those? How do you even do that? You have to somehow convince the majority that they too are being oppressed, and that's something I learned. The gag laws, they were so successful because they convinced white people in America that their own rights were being violated. White people didn't care about slaves. They didn't care about black people who were free. They said, oh yeah, I'm, my rights, my rights to, to, to put in a petition, that's been violated, so I'm going to sign that petition. We're going to fight against this thing. We're going to overturn this in 1844. They didn't do it for the right reasons. But that's how democracy works. This is, my friends, why I believe that pioneers, again, this is radical to say, but they said it. This is why they recognize that America is a beast in revelation. It has two more. It looks like a land that speaks like a dragon. It claims to give civil liberty and religious liberty to everybody, but it denies those liberties to minorities, either racial or religious minorities. <coughs> That's a sobering thought, and I'll be frank with you. Our pioneers were way more radical than I am. I sometimes wonder if I can stand up to that, because you're not going to be popular. People are going to attack you, and some have attacked me for just talking about this. It will happen. No one likes to do this kind of thing because it takes so much energy. You get worn out. But there's one thing that we need to re remember and recognize if you look like me, and that is I could bow out. I'm not being oppressed, never have been, never will be, probably, because I'm white, never will happen. But for people who don't look like me, if they back them, they continue to not have the right to issue. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've seen is that a lot of times when people don't feel like stepping up and it could be a dangerous <coughs> position for them or whatever, it's part because they don't understand what's really going on. They don't connect the dots. I think so. But back to what you're talking about with the pioneers, we had key people who had the vision who saw things, who connected the dots, who spoke out and educated people. So my question, do you see that happening at all today as we get more into the end times? Or is that not happening yet? Because I'm, I'm expecting that at some point people will arise here and there, uh, connect the dots, come together, and then we'll see things begin to happen. It could be. I I, uh, I see us blind still. And I think I think that we are. And and one of the things for me personally has been education for me. Um, I I don't mind telling you, although it's not something I thought about, but I used to be racist. Okay, I grew up in the American South, and what racism meant and means today is that I didn't see a problem. I didn't see a problem. We elected Obama, so we must be in a post-racist age. I was blinded to all the injustices that are happening. Uh, in this country on an almost daily basis. And so I ended my PhD program thinking that that was true. Um, I ended up having some confrontations with some of my colleagues that, that embarrassed me for a while. And then I realized, especially after taking a race and religion class at, at, at Florida State University, that oh my word, there is a problem. And I can't deny it. After taking that class, I was so drawn and interested in the subject that I said I wanted to focus on that and I made Race studies, a, a, a cognate of my dissertation, of my PhD. So I read a whole host of books for my comprehensive exams, and then my dissertation got got channeled in this direction. But to be perfectly blunt with you, you know what the captain of all of this was? It was Joseph Bates. My jaw dropped when I saw that Joseph Bates was not just signing petitions on all these radical things, that some of which I've shared, but that he circulated them. Mm. And he was an Adventist while he did it. Mm. And I said to myself, what am I doing or not doing? And I said, at that point, something's got to change. And I started looking at our pioneers in a completely different way. 
I had thought that they were all super conservative, that they just stayed silent, that they were not doing anything. I wanted to know if that was true. If it was not true, what did they do? What, what did they not do on slavery? And so, when I, but I, when I found out about Bates in particular, one of our co-founders, that was it for me. That was it for me. And so, it changed my life. And I think that knowledge and understanding of the problems and the opportunities and possibilities can do that for other people too. And I've, I've seen some people doing that in my ministry department. I've had, I've had a man in your brother-in-law's church, actually, right, spoke here a little over a year ago, in his 80s, come up to me and apologize. He said he first wanted to hit me. <laughs> but then he said, as he kept listening, he said, you know what? He's right. And he had estranged his son because he married a black girl. Mm -hmm. And he came up to me and he apologized and he said, and this in his knees. He said, I see that racism is wrong. I'm sorry and I'm going to try to mend that relationship. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he's done it, but there's hope. There's hope. I need to get down because we have a, a much more distinguished state coming up here. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>